Yes, great. We are live. We are live. So hi, everybody. Um, I'm so glad you could join us today. My name is Kelly Wendorf. I'm the founding CEO of Equus. And welcome to our regular live event where we talk about important issues that affect all of us. Today, I am joined by Dr. Mario Martinez clinical neuropsychologist. He's author of many books, among them, um, The Mind Body Code. I just have to show you my copy that has like a bazillion little things in there. The screen froze? Hello? work for years up oh, now we're back on i don't know oh, what great. we missed but i'm just gonna i'm just gonna keep going right. <laughs> um he is quoted at length in my book flying lead change and his work is required reading for those who embark on a certification program with me so i'm really delighted to have you here as oh, our guest you. dr martinez yeah thank you for having me Mm. Um, and before we start, I would love to just acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional indigenous custodians of this land uh, on which Equus sits, the Tasuki and Tewa land, um, the elders and ancestors past, present and future. We um, acknowledge and give respect to those people who came before us and took such good care of this place so that we could be here today. Um, and to begin, um, Dr. Martinez, I wanted to set some context for our conversation on how you and I connected and, um, um, and what brought about this conversation and, and where we're going to go together today. As many of you know, Equus has legally arranged to give back half of its property Buffalo Spirit Ranch to the ancestral carers of this area, the Tewa people, the Tasuki Pueblo people. Um, and Dr. Martinez and I engaged in some conversation um, about that over LinkedIn. And I invited him to dialogue with me about the cultural impacts um, of stolen land, of our compassion and our um, social justice activism. Are we on the right track? Are we not on the right track? How do we do this? Um, and the impact of that shame, um, that cultural shame on <clears throat> all of us and, um, and the cultural impacts of um, reconciliative movements that give property back um, and other such um, uh, movements. But I wanted to give a broader context to this conversation in case you're not familiar with Dr. Martinez's work. And please excuse me, Dr. Martinez, I'm going to way oversimplify and I hope I'm on the right track. So please correct me if I articulate something um, incorrectly. But um, Dr. Martinez developed a theory called biocognitive theory, which is based on the research that demonstrates how thoughts and, and their biological expression co-merge within a cultural history, within a cultural soup. And that this cultural network, cultural soup of belief systems and narratives actually has an impact on our personal health, our well-being, our success, and our longevity. Um, I guess to put it really simply, what our culture believes we take on, whether we realize it or not, and it impacts us individually and very specifically. Is that fair to say? Would you add anything to that, Dr. Martinez? No, that's good. That's a good start. Great. <laughs> um, and so this is the lens through which we will be discussing ways to attend to inequities and oppression in our society. Um, because, uh, you know, as it is, it has, as it is said, we cannot solve the problems that were created with the same consciousness that those problems were created. And, um, and if we're not careful, our, our cultural um, overlays will make us 
perpetuate violence and racism and all these other issues without realizing it. Um, so we want to make sure that we are not accidentally operating within oppressive, colonized, reductive thinking when trying to address things like racism and stolen lands and, and mar marginalization. Um, and, and so how do we avoid that? So to address this, Dacha Martinez has coined a term called culturally informed compassion. And I think I'll just hand it over to you from here, Dr. Martinez. What is culturally informed compassion? And yeah, I, I just want to know more. Okay. Um, well, um, um, as you mentioned, I'm a neuropsychologist, but I'm also, um, I do uh, quite a bit of cultural anthropology. So I've worked with different groups uh, with uh, anywhere from uh, maximum security facility psychiatric um, uh, types of uh, environments, uh, of course, uh, First Nation Americans and uh, uh, African Americans and centenarians. And what what I've done is I've, I've tried to bring the concept of uh, inequity and the concept of uh, oppressor and oppressed into a, a wider scenario, because otherwise what happens if we simplify things and we use what what I call naive compassion and create the oppressor and the oppressed as if there was a monopoly of, uh, of, of ethnicity or race. Basically, infamy is a human flaw. And it's, be mm. it's been from the beginning. And we have to see that. We have to understand that so we don't vilify or victimize. And so, for example, it's, let's go back just to the Romans, back uh, in, in the year uh, 43 uh, uh, after Christ. They they enslaved the Britons. They were in in, in Britain for over seven eight hundred years, uh, for and uh, and they they enslaved the Vikings enslaved the Britons. Um, the uh, First Nations um, Americans enslaved uh, African Americans. In fact, in the in the Trail of of, of of Tears, when they were which was terrible, they they had uh, the, uh, over a hundred thousand. Uh, natives uh, moved from from their places. So they took their slaves with them. They they had slaves. Oh, they had black yeah. slaves. The uh, so it's a human uh, condition. John Ross was a Cherokee chief. He had slaves. Um, so when the when the Apaches raided uh, uh, and the Comanches raided, they took slaves. They raped. They did everything. So it's a human condition that we need to look at. Blacks enslaving blacks. The last country in the world to outlaw. Uh, Slavery was um, uh, Mauritania, and it was in mm. 1981 in northern Africa, and it wasn't uh, taken into law until 2001. So we have that. So we have to understand that it's a human flaw that needs to be dealt with. And the other thing with it, too, is that if we don't, then we begin to do things that we think are um, compassionate, and we think that they are uh, equitable and uh and repair the damage and without understanding the uh, the types of um, the, the fabric and the depth of the of the uh, of the culture. So I'll give you an example. Um, one, I won't mention the name because she's very well known, but a, a very powerful uh, superstar. She went to an African village and she she saw that the women had to walk about two miles to get the water. So she thought, OK, well, let me help them. And I will then build a, uh, I'm going to build a, a well right in the center of town. Nobody went there. Nobody went there because what happened was that that walk was a way to complain about the husbands, the, the latest, right. the latest uh, uh, gossip. So it's a cultural component to it. So I'll be explaining what we do with that, what we do, how we do the, the actual reparation and coming in. Another yeah. example is when, uh, I worked with the Wakanaki uh, um, uh, uh, natives or First Nation, and they, they uh, as you know, and many of the Native Americans and, and uh, or First Nation, as I like to call them, have problems with alcohol and drugs. Uh, there's a lot of dishonoring, a lot of things that went on. So they wanted to bring in the, a, uh, some rehab. They wanted to bring an AA model, and they started the AA model, they're doing the AA and everything, and they were having all kinds of problems. People were, it was getting worse. So they asked me to come in, and what was happening is that they were imposing as a hegemony, imposing something on a culture 
So for example, uh, AA is, is an American invention and it's for Westerners. Uh, so what they were doing is that in AA, you have to uh, confess that you are an alcoholic and you, and they were making the, the Wabanakis confess and the Wabanakis confess in, uh, in a different way. And the, and the hot, um, uh, what are they called? The hot, um, just dropped the name. Uh, the sweat sweat logs. That's where they do that. It's no confession. It's a physiological release, and that has the same effect as if you confess, "I'm an alcoholic and I've done wrong." Well, by doing that, they were shaming them even more because they were they were being shamed. The other one was honoring yourself when you go to the sweat logs. So those kind of things are what we have to be careful with with the what I call the naive uh, uh, compassion. Because if not, then what happens is that we're we're making things worse. The other thing right. too is that we don't want to give things without any commitment or without any uh, any owning of uh, of mm -hmm. the responsibility. I worked with uh, uh, Ireland, the the uh, uh, country of Ireland, and uh, I worked with their the equivalent of the social services for the elderly, and they were just giving things away, and and it just wasn't working very well. So I asked them a simple question: What are you asking them to give you back? Oh, nothing. They're old; they can't do anything. They were continuing to be sick, so we changed the model into bringing them in so they could share their knowledge, so they could share, they could get involved with the community, and then they would have that whatever it is that they were being given, and it changed completely. With Apaches, I worked with Apaches, young Apaches, uh, and I'm leading to what we usually do, but uh, they were very high with uh, uh, drugs and alcohol, and we were able to bring them back into the rites uh, of passage, which they're, they're gone, rites of passage for all cultures are gone, uh, and um, and bring the honor back that's in the fabric of their culture, and there was a significant reduction in the abuse of drugs and, and alcohol and so forth. So what we do is we do something that I call the ethnic circles. So for example, we want to work with, uh, let's say, the Wabanakis, and the first thing that we do is we do ethnography. We go in there to find out what's happening, and we bring in the elders, the keepers of the wisdom, and the elders will tell us what they need in order to deal with the issues with bringing meaning. I mean, Aristotle was right. You have to have meaning in purpose and meaning in um, in service to have the uh, more than the hedonic life. And for example, in my area of uh, psychoneurology, um, Aristotle, 2,300 years ago, he said the, the, uh, <clears throat> the hedonic life is not enough. The life for pleasure for pleasure is not enough. You have to have pleasure and meaning, in purpose, and in um, and service. So you know that's very nice and everything. But recently, there was re research that was done, very specific psychoneurological research, and they divided people into two groups: psychologically, the one that were more hedonic, pleasure seeking, and the epitome of that would be drug abuse, <clears throat> and the people that were more uh, what what they, what Aristotle called eudaimonia which uh, you means good and daemon is the, the spirit, the good spirit. Mm. And they me they measure something very specific, some genes in the uh, immune cells called CTRA. It's how, they, how these genes respond to adversity with anti-inflammatory, with anti-virus and, and, uh, and, and anti-bacteria. The people that were more eudaimonia, like uh, Aristotle said, had better CTRA than people that were hedonic. And they both measured the same level of, of happiness and the same level of pleasure. The immune system could cut through that and could see what is the implicit value of the uh, of the service to, to self and others. So that's mm. stuff. You don't see that in any uh, ma major medical journals because you can't bottle that. So it's not the kind of thing that, but it's there. And, and there's much more. So what we did is we went to the elders to find out rather than assume that they need a, a well in the middle of town what are the rituals what are the things that they need so then we we brought in the elders who were discarded they were marginalized and they were just acting like old people we brought them back into the archetype that they had hundreds of years ago of leading the the young and teaching them and we and it was a tremendous successful experience because it's it's inherent but you have to bring okay. it up. So those are the things that we're very interested in. So it's very important to look at, okay, if we want to do reparation, do we want to go back to the Romans and then the Romans have to give to the Britons uh, and, and on and on and on. The Apaches have to give to the Cherokees. 
So rather than doing that, we want to ask, what do you need? And the government didn't ask, what do you need? And there are casinos and you have this and that. And it's tremendous corruption and tremendous right, alcohol right. Abuse because they didn't ask the fabric of the culture what the culture needs. So that's what I'm suggesting. If we want to give something back, what is it that you need? Or is it that you just need land? No. The other thing that happens <clears throat> is when things are given to people that have been marginalized for a long time, instead of feeling gratitude because of the amount of abuse, they feel, well, it's about time that you took care of us. Mm, no entitlement, right. Entitlement, that's an entitlement. Mm -hmm. And if you have gratitude, you have oxytocin, endorphins, uh, serotonin, dopamine. But if you have that kind of a sense of entitlement, it drops it, nothing happens. Right, right, so okay. Behind this. So I want to kind of circle, gather all this around and feed it back to you to make sure that we're all on the right track here. So what happens is that, um, and for those of you who haven't read Dr. Martinez's work, he talks about that there are three archetypal wounds, um, shame, betrayal, and abandonment. And that those archetypal root wounds have three antidotes. The antidote to shame is honor. The antidote to betrayal is loyalty. The antidote to abandonment is commitment. And when we think about how injustices, oppression, violence has been perpetuated throughout human history, not just you know in certain colonized times. When we think of not think about colonized time frames, we think about it outside of a geopolitical framework, and we think about the oppression that has happened throughout human history, because that is something that humans do to each other, then it changes a little bit the, the, the shame-based model of oppressed and oppressor, and forces us to look at how do we how do we create reparations that don't reinforce shame? Because when we have shame in our bodies, we get ill and we get poor and we die early, right? And when we attend with the right kind of honor, in other words, the well in the middle of the town was not, was not the right kind of solution. It had nothing to do with the larger fabric of that culture. So, if we're not careful, we give the wrong solution and that solution simply reinforces the shame story, which creates more illness, poverty and um, disease. Right. Did I summarize that correctly? Yes. Yes. And, and that and that and the, the most important thing is a, a Socratic uh, way to go to th about things before you give anything to anybody. What do you need and what are you willing to do for it? That empowers mm. And, mm -hmm. and you're right. You know biocognition very well. Those are the antidotes. And uh, and we know now that shame is inflammatory. Shame causes uh, molecules of inflammation. And honor, we're beginning to test that. Honor is anti-inflammatory. So, yes. But it's really honor to self. So when you have been mm -hmm. shamed, there's not honor out there. It's honor to self to take back what was taken away from you. What was taken away from you, away from you was with shame. The way you get it back is with the same of a, a, a concept of, of honor. Mm -hmm. So that's what's important. So the question would be, if I want to give you something, first, let me ask, uh, am I doing it out of guilt, number one? If I'm doing it out of guilt, I don't want to do it. Am I doing it with eudaimonia? Then fine. And the second question is, what do you need and how can you be? How can you become empowered in whatever you get back? So, for example, it, uh, we do a lot of work with... Uh, big corporations and and many executives have all kinds of problems and one of the ways to make people sick in an organization is two things you can do you give them responsibility without authority or you give them a job without meaning within a few months they start getting sick or they start having all kinds of problems so it's mm -hmm. so important to do that and this is what we and we always how do you how do you do it bring the elders in the elder and the elders are usually marginalized but when you bring them back into a place where they have epigenetic memories of many, many years of being guides, they're brought back and all of a sudden, not only are they empowered, but people listen to them because it's in the fabric of the culture. And that's what I call uh -huh. the, the, uh, the, the, that compassionate uh, uh, informed uh, culture. So this compassionate informed culture can be um, 
across corporate, I mean, anything, family, yeah. society, corporate culture, across the whole thing. Homo sapiens. And, and that's why it's so important right. to not put it into just a group of people that it's yes. we're, we're all that we all have that. <laughs> yes, yes. So, okay. So um, I want to talk about the, the um, actions that we took here at Equus and sort of unpack it from what you're speaking about, because this is very, very eye-opening. And also how it might be relevant to other people, because of course, people come from all kinds of, of different means and abilities to, uh, and they want to reinstill honor back into our society. And how do they do that? But I think I'll first start with me and then we can sort of talk about other people and how it's, how it's relevant for them. Um, I had, um, I am fortunate enough to have a, a close relationship with the Pueblo people here because we're neighbors. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a, um, a, a close in relationship with my ranch manager, who is a wisdom carrier of the Tasuki people here. And the land back idea came to us together, not from like it was the cool thing to do or um you know, I'm such a guilty white person and I should do this um, because really it, I don't even, uh, guilt didn't enter into it. But he told me a story about how small patches of land make it, uh, that are purchased by uh, people, make it impossible for his people to access their sacred land. And there's patchwork pieces that can weave in that help their people to access their sacred land on foot or on bike or whatever. And this little piece is not much, you know, comparatively, it's five acres, but it's a patch. It's a patch that can knit together and make other patches come together so that they can access their sacred land. Um, the, but then, and so the, the, the question was asked, what do you need? We need a little patchwork piece. That's what we need. Um, and then we brought in the governor and um, and the governor uh, also, I think, communed also with the war chief and some of the other elders in the in the tribe. <clears throat> so it feels that. We are on the right track with re with regards to um, culturally informed compassion, or yes. would you say that, no, we missed the mark somewhere. We're still perpetuating. Some no, no, because look, the first thing you said is you you asked, what do you need? That's that's a mm -hmm. that's a key question. What do you need? And then uh, somebody could have thought, okay, that we'll put some money in the bank, or we're going to get you some stock and 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 Apple. They right. don't need that. <laughs> they need <laughs> what they need, which is the land and and that kind of thing. But I'll give you um, uh, another example with uh, Ellen Langer. She's done a lot of work with. Uh, uh, people, uh, ages, and as we talked about, it, all kinds of different groups of people. And she did mm -hmm. a very simple experiment where she went to a nursing home, her her people. She's a, a psychologist at Harvard. And she and I have done very similar work. And she, had, she divided uh, nursing homes into two parts. One part, she gave the, uh, the, the uh, um, residents a plant that they needed to take care of themselves. And then the other part, they gave them a plant that said, here's a plant, but the nurses are going to take care for it for it, for you. They waited two to three years. The ones that were taking care of the plant themselves lived longer significantly than the others because it's mm -hmm. a responsibility. That's, so Aristotle is right. So the question is, what? how can we bring you in? And, of course, this is something that that is not something that we want to talk about, but we have to. There are people that don't want any help. They just mm -hmm. want to continue to be victims. And mm -hmm, those people mm -hmm. just leave them alone and allow them to be victims, mm -hmm. but not all. Yes. Fortunately, it's a minority, but there are people that don't want any help. They mm -hmm. just want to be victims for the rest of their lives, and they don't have very good health, and they don't live very long because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and to try and give help when help is not wanted, whether it's a friend, a spouse, somebody right. in our community, yeah. anything, uh, just perpetuates the cycle of of illness um right. because right we're tending to something that doesn't want what doesn't want help so how how might people start to think about when they're um in their daily life wanting to do the right thing either for their child or for their a family member or for somebody in their community or 
for a, a nonprofit, it starts with asking, what do you want? And listening, <laughs> I'm hearing that. Um, it also includes that there is right relationship to the giving that, that in, in the natural order of things, we give and we receive. So people have to take care of their own plant, so to speak. Um, so how, how might people start to think differently and notice if they're caught up in that old paradigm of um, just causing uh, naive compassion and the problems associated with that? versus stepping into something different. How, how can we make this um, really black and white, really simple to yeah. follow? Well, you, you're, you're following a, a good path. The way that you're describing it is you're really right on target. But what I would suggest is that it's really important. We have to be very authentic with ourselves. So the first question we have to ask, am I doing this to fill a void that I need to fill myself? That's mm. the first thing you have to ask. Am I, am I, doing, this, am I doing this because of sin? Uh, back in the Middle uh, Ages, they had uh, the sin eaters. They would come in before someone was dying. They were very uh, wealthy, and they would bring the sin eaters. The sin eaters would put bread in front of the person who was dying on 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 their stomach, and then that would absorb the sins, and the sin eater would eat it. So it's that kind of uh, sin eater type of thing. So if that's not the case, then the question is, uh, where is the pleasure that I'm finding in this? Is the pleasure that I'm finding in giving and also in learning about what they need that's mm -hmm. really the key i want to give but, mm -hmm. I, but but one of the pleasures is what what uh, aristotle said again the purpose of and service so if i want to give i have pleasure in giving because i reduce suffering but in addition to that the pleasure that i have is that i see that i discovered something that somebody needs that i didn't know about and that and then i can be of service and i can have purpose in that particular area. not only is it the good way to do it but you have all kinds of good psychoneurology for your own health by doing things mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So, um, so check in with one's motives. And you know, as I'm sitting here, I'm realizing, wow, just everything we do puts us on a trajectory of everything we do and think, and all the thing, all the ways we behave, puts us on a trajectory of health and wellness, or puts us on a trajectory of you know, illness. Right. Right. And um, so, so, and I think too about the hierarchy that happens with this idea that there is someone better giving to someone who's more marginalized and it sets up this hierarchy. Yes. And are, aren't we great? Look at what we're doing. <laughs> and that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> that's a great point because at that point, then you ask yourself, what could this person give me that I don't have? Not a quid pro quo, but could, what, right. could, what knowledge could this person give me that I don't have? And then you have a bonding and it's no longer I'm better than you and I'm giving you something, but it's an exchange of, of abundance. Yes. Uh, and, uh, when I went to Cuba to, to do some work there with uh, some of the, at the university, um, I, I would go to some of the people's homes and they had just very little, but they wanted to share it with me. And it was a wonderful experience of abundance with from from deprivation from nothing. <laughs> it's like uh, yes. Uh, so that's a very important thing that you brought up. That you want to look at this. This is an exploration because we're all Homo sapiens, and I'm not this. I'm not that. This is why I said let's go broad. And right. then you you have something, and it could be just a friendship that you have uh, that you can offer me, and that would be tremendous for me. But not with a quid pro quo. But with a, right. with, with, uh, a kind of like co-authoring of abundance is a way to, to look mm, at it. Yes. Yes. So it's, a, it's an invitation for co-authoring. And also the words that come to mind are humility and vulnerability. I, if I am not in that place of, look at me, I'm so great. I'm taking care of these people or this person. But I'm um, asking for friendship or asking for support or asking to learn um, and asking to be um, informed by the, the, the certain social fabrics of a community that I don't understand. That suddenly makes me humble and vulnerable. And, and well, I'm just wondering how humility and vulnerability, if attached to meaning and purpose, how okay. those impact the body. 
I'm glad you brought that up because I want to save you from potential problems. Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> humility is extremely good, but real humility. But yes. vulnerability is dangerous. Mm. Vulnerability is very dangerous because we have, as homo sapiens, we have 150,000 years where vulnerability meant exposure to danger. So you notice that animals, they expose themselves and, and they have the, the stomach so you can kill me if you want to. So rather than being vulnerable, which empathics have a real problem, empaths have a real problem with that vulnerability. I'm going to be vulnerable. No, you don't want to be vulnerable. And they say, well, children are vulnerable. Children are not vulnerable. What the research has done with developmental psychology, they, they, find, they find that they do a, um, a gradual trusting. They look mm. for the trait processes. So somebody out there, a little, a little boy, a little girl out there, and they're they're wearing uh, black, and they're and they 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 look like they're they're aggressive, almost a pheromones that they can they can smell. They're 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 trusting uh, with with uh, with a a sense of uh, gradual gradual trust with with evidence. So what you want to do instead of being an empath, empath empathy is just a very primitive uh, knowing that you're identifying with the pain of someone else. But if you're not careful, your body will feel the pain of someone else and in, in, in hormones with the uh, what they call the mirror mm -hmm. neurons. Mm -hmm. And it was made so you could feel like a zebra is, uh, sees another zebra being killed uh, by, by, by a lion. The mirror neurons were made to make them think that is them so they could run. So empathy is the first movement. The second, and the empathy says, I, I, I feel your pain. Literally, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you got to move on to the higher level where we're more evolved now. We have to go to compassion, which is what mm. can I do for you? But it's not my pain; it's your pain. What can I mm -hmm. do for you? And if you don't want anything, that's fine. But if you want something, I can help you with your pain. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. I did a workshop in uh, at Blue Spirit in in Costa Rica. I try to go to really fun places for to do my workshops but um they have some empaths there and, and, and empaths don't have good health because of that so one of the simple techniques that i taught them was a neuropsychological technique so for example if now i see you doing something that that makes me feel like i need to help you my humanity is going to make me feel a certain amount of stress mm -hmm. so what's happening is I'm, I'm triggering my mirror neurons and i'm saying I feel Kelly's pain, and I am feeling it. But then you stop and say, okay, now how can I change that? And knowing how the brain works, how do you turn off those neurons, those uh, uh, mirror neurons, by selfing? Because selfing goes to another part of the brain, and you very simply say, I am a man, she's a woman, she's blonde, and I'm not. Her name is Kelly, my name is... By doing that, you're forcing the brain to go into selfing. Okay. The, mm -hmm. the insulin mm -hmm. other parts. And then that cuts the, the mirror neurons, you don't get hit with the with the stress that they're feeling. And then I can go and say, Kelly, what can I help you with? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. And you're doing it not because you're trying to relieve your pain because you're feeling me, but That's you me. are just you just feel compassion. Yes. So yes. so that OK, if we can go anywhere, if that's all right with you, that um, makes me think about. You know, right now with all the terror happening in the world and all the just terrible images on the news and all of that, how easy it is to fall into a, an empathy that then makes us sick. Yes. But we don't, we don't, you know, kind people don't want to disconnect. They want to be of help. They want to, you know, so what you're talking about is to develop that empathy into compassion that allows us to ask the right questions. And yes. respond from the right place that doesn't harm us and doesn't harm them. That's right. And you you do these simple, they're, they're deceptively simple, but there's a lot of neuropsychology in what I gave you there. But mm -hmm. for example, let's say that uh, that you're very concerned now with what's happening with Israel and 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 mm -hmm. the uh, and Gaza and all that. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing you can do. I mean, you can you can send money, but there's nothing you can do immediately. One of the questions that you can ask yourself. Is okay. I have empathy. Let me cut the empathy and let me go into compassion. Where do I give compassion? First, you ask yourself, let me give myself compassion now. I need to do a little meditation. I need to clean this up. And then what around me needs something that I could use? Because what's happening is it creates a uh, uh, what in in in, in brain work, it, it's a an incompleteness, it's a, a need to complete. So if I go da 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 da, you want to go da da. If if you have that that lack of closure. This stress when yes. you, 
when you bring the closure, it reduces the stress. So the stress comes up with, I'm helpless in doing anything for those people. Right. But that doesn't mean I'm helpless to do anything for myself or my immediate surrounding. It could be right. as simple as your daughter, can I bring you a glass of water? Anything. The brain says, okay, now you've met. That's the way to really bring it in. But what happens is that you're creating a compassionate consciousness. And then later, uh, you can say, okay. Okay, what can I do for those people later? But but right. the brain doesn't want to wait till later. It wants to deal with it now. And if you put it away, then you go into that empathy, which is hurting you. It, it's very mm -hmm. empathy actually causes a lot of uh, a lot of stress, a lot of uh, a lot of stress and illness, yeah, right? Uh, yeah, cortisol, because we're feeling. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yes. And uh, uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine, because yep. it because it's saying, see, the mirror neurons are very primitive. You know that there's a difference. Mm -hmm. The brain doesn't know that it's you or someone else. It teaches mm -hmm. you that for you to run. But then since we're not animals, we have a higher level. We go to compassion, which is what we created. And then compassion allows us to get out of the mirror neurons, go into selfing, the insula and other areas. And then you can help. But I don't feel your pain. I just want to help yes. you with your pain. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That is so powerful. Yeah. Um, that just that's so powerful what you're saying right now. Um, and you know, for people who are watching, especially right now, because so many of my clients are coming to me and saying, oh, my God, the shooting and this and 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 they're very overwhelmed and overcome by what you say. They, the, the loop can't be closed. They want to do something. They want to help. But the loop can't be closed because they can't do anything. Um, so this piece about, OK, you're feeling the pain now individualize. I am me over here in this other country. I can't do anything over there, at least not right now. Um, and um, opening my heart to the situation, but not opening my whole body, mind, psyche to being hurt <clears throat> by the situation. Um, and then closing the loop by extending compassion to myself and then to whoever's nearby, getting water for my daughter, um, helping out a friend, feeding the dog, closer. whatever. That's right. Yeah, yeah. You, you yeah. bring closer, and then what you're doing is you're you're responding to something that was very primitive with an evolved process. You don't wow. let it. Uh, uh, you don't let it keep you uh, uh, the zebras. Uh, Robert Sapolsky wrote a book. Uh, he said, um, uh, "Right, yeah." Uh, yeah. About the, why zebras don't 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 get uh, right. ulcers. <laughs> uh, ulcers, and that's because they forget about it. We're the only ones who. The other thing that 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 we don't want to do, is uh, well, the Germans have a a, a word for it. They they uh, says the the uh, the suffering of the world. You don't want to take the suffering of the world, because you can't handle it. If it would help the world, that's fine. But all it's going to do is going to make you sick, and you're not going to be in the world very long. So then what can I do? Well, the things that we're talking about is what you can do. Mm -hmm. You can begin to look at what's missing within me and what's missing with the people that I love and what's missing with the next level of what I need to do. And then the other thing is to look at, at what we do with reruns, because while we're in the subject, let's help empaths. Um, let's say you're driving around and somebody gets in front of you. And you oh, my God. And, and, <laughs> You can't wait to get to the office or home to tell people what happened to you. What you're doing is you're dancing adrenaline when mm -hmm. you get to So what, what do I do? I stop and I get angry because righteous anger is very, anger is very good, but it's contextual. Okay, I get angry with this idiot and whatever you want to call it. You stop. Okay, now it's time for me to listen to some music, to relax, and I make a commitment that I'm not going to tell anybody what happened. Mm. Because if I go to work, right. then somebody is going to out-victimize me. They're going to say, oh, that's nothing. Yesterday, two cars got in front of me. But what you're doing is you're dancing adrenaline. The brain doesn't mm -hmm. know the difference. And you're still living the, the adrenaline dance. Right. And, and the brain doesn't know the difference between what's really happening and what you're remembering is happening. That's right. So you're just creating more stress cocktail for yourself and then also spreading <laughs> it amongst others. And, and you know, again, just to way oversimplified, but your work is incredible in how it points to, and that's what makes us sick because yeah, we're, and, we're pouring all these chemicals into our bodies and responding from these places that make us sick. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and the idea here is to, <clears throat> to understand 
uh, somebody asked a really good question. It reminded me of because you come up with some really bright things, and it reminded me of someone asked, well, if that happened to you, don't you need to confess it? Don't you need a catharsis to release it? Don't you need to tell people what happened? No, you don't need to tell anybody what happened. You tell yourself what happened. You clean it up. And that, because catharsis doesn't solve anything. Catharsis, all it does right. is it releases something, but it doesn't bring resolution. So Freud right. was wrong there. It's not just a, right. it's more right. than that. Well, he didn't, yeah. he was a neurologist, but he didn't have the, the knowledge that we have now. So he did a great job. Right. The other thing well, is- we, he, talk, we, we talk about feeling the feelings all the way through in that moment. Yes. So if you're yes. if you're angry, okay, you're angry, but you're feeling it through in that moment so that it can just yeah, it can close the loop. It says so you don't take it out of context. If it's out of context, right. it becomes chronic anger. Right. That's bad for you. Right, right. Righteous anger, my mentor George Solomon, who created psychoneurology, coined that word, righteous anger. <clears throat> when he worked with women uh who were uh, who had the what they called the um, and the, uh, the, their, their arthritic um, um, triggering, uh, and they, you have the, the, uh, the arthritis factor. Okay, if you have the arthritis factor, you're going to have arthritis, and that's it. He found that some had the factor and some didn't, and some developed it and some didn't. So he was a UCLA in, at that time, and they didn't know anything about psychoneurology. He created psychoneurology. So um, he starts looking at uh, with the arthritis <clears throat> then many, many women, and it's more women than men, has some kind of a, what we know now, a, a shaming wound. And many have been, have been sexually abused or have been abused some way or another. So he studied siblings and, and uh, uh, twins to have some real close DNA. And what I'm going to tell you about the siblings pretty much generalizes to the rest of the population. These were two sisters in their 40s. One had advanced uh, uh, damage from the uh, ligaments and so forth from the arthritis. The other one, totally perfect. They both had the factor, the rheumatoid factor. Okay. So he starts asking, this guy, it can't be genetics. It can't be because what's going on here? They both had been uh, profoundly sexually abused by their father. So the one with the arthritis, uh, he asked her about what was going on. She said, well, I go to the, where's your father? And well, he's in a nursing home and I go see him. And when I see him, everything just flares up because he'll ask me to tell him that I that I love him. And I tell him, and then I go to my rheumatologist and he says, oh, it's just feeling sorry for your dad. It's the stress. Okay, we didn't know anything about it in those days, so it's okay, you can call it stress. The other sister, he asked her the same thing. What is your relationship with your father? That's what he discovered, Righteous Anger. She said, I can't wait for the SOB to die so I can spit on his grave. <laughs> no symptoms. Now, she didn't carry it. She wasn't an angry person. She right. had contextual anger, yes. and he called yes. it righteous anger. Yes. For the immune system. Yeah, so yes. that's, that's powerful. That's powerful stuff. Yes. Yes, it uh, is. Yes, indeed. Wow. Yes. So, um, okay, my mind, my brains are all over everywhere now because my mind is <laughs> truly, tr truly blown. <laughs> um, I guess what what I would, would ask of you today, um, Dr. Martinez, is um, if you if you could if you could give our listeners today one helpful either action step or something to remember, because a lot of wrong is going on in the world right now. A lot of you know a lot of uh, uh, people are trying to help. A lot of people feeling things. What what would be one thing that you would tell them so that you just shift things a little enough that they put themselves on the right trajectory that they stay resilient and and thriving in these really difficult times? Well, first to pay attention to the body to see what the body's saying, what's going on with your body, <clears throat> and then you try to bring the emotions and everything else that's going on. But then the next question is, what is my motive to do something? If I want to do what is my motive? Because that will tell you whether you're doing that out of guilt, out of boredom, uh, out of filling a, a void of your own. And then if, if you find that there's something, take care of that first before you take care of anybody. Caretakers wow. don't, don't have very good health because of that. They're, wow. they're out there taking care of everybody. Uh, and, and then what happens is they, they don't have body cues to let them know 
when enough is enough, they lose that, they desensitize. So they're taking care of people and they have body cues saying, you got to sleep, you got to drink, you got to this, you got to that. And after a while, the body says, okay, I'll show you. And it breaks. And they only stop when they get sick because of that. So that's the first thing. And then the other one is that we can't fix the world. We don't have that much power. All we can do is we can we can help our immediate uh, surroundings. And then we go beyond that. So those, if, if you do that, you're going to be in really good shape. You're not going to be into the to the empathic uh, sickness because it gets yeah. you out of that. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. And, and then the other thing, when I was, you know, when I was a kid, <clears throat> the the hungry people were Bangladesh. Eat your food. They're they're hungry children in Bangladesh. You know that kind of thing. So they're teaching you guilt for abundance. Right. Guilt for abundance. When I yes. when I said it to my daughter, I said Bangladesh. No, that's not cool anymore. It's not Bangladesh now. It's Nepal. Okay, all right. So. <laughs> Anyway, she so said, if you if you want to give them the food, give them the food. So what what I did then is I said, okay, now what do I do when I feel abundant, when I feel I have wonderful food and there's so many people out there that have nothing? I want to become a model of what other people could do. Mm -hmm. I want to live with abundance so people can see the, the model of what could happen. And that takes away the guilt and it takes away, I want to have abundance. I want to have, I want to feel really good. I don't want to apologize for my, my good fortune or whatever. Because I want to share that with you as a model of what's possible. Like, for example, yes. the four-minute mile. It, it, it wasn't possible to happen. till finally they broke it. Now there's 3.43, 3, whatever. So you want to go to, to levels where you can say, if this is possible, then I can do it too. Yeah, right, right. When the train was invented, the doctors would say, look, our bodies were made to not go faster than on a horse. 32 miles an hour, that's all you can go. So the trains went 45 miles an hour. They started develop, developing what they called um, uh, rail back disorder. And they would go to the doctor and say, what do you want? I mean, you're going faster than the body was made to. So the cultures also have to have horizons that need to be brought up higher. Yeah. Wow. Yes. The cultures have to have horizons. And so you and people who are willing to step forward and, and model a thriving life, modeling, model a joyful life, model an abundant life, help raise that cultural ceiling so that we can do better. That's the, just so The obtainability goes up. It, it, oh, you can yes. do it. Well, I can do it. Oh, yeah, yes. but you've got this or that. No, what I what I don't have is excuses. That's what I don't yes. have. Yes. And, yes. and then, yes. then you empower people because you, you can empower any, almost anybody, not everybody, but almost anybody, when you allow them to bring out what I call that inner force that you have that's been epigenetically. I mean, think about this for a second. I, I wrote a <clears throat> little piece I, I called, uh, We're Living Miracles Waiting to Be Believed. And mm -hmm. what happens is that from the moment of conception, you are a miracle. 100 million sperms start to reach the egg. They go there, and when they get closer, they go to fallopian tubes, and then when they get to the uterus, and and by the way, the, the egg decides who, who gets in. It's not the right. other one. So anyway, <laughs> there are about 200 left. And then the egg starts sending some, some chemicals of attraction into the fluid. And then not the smartest or, or, the, or the fittest, but the one who makes chemical meaning of what's being sent to, that, to him is the one that, that makes it. So 100 million, and then there's a you. You're already a miracle. Just by waking up, you're a miracle. And you have many, many other things. By looking at it that way, then we can see that not only are we miracles, but the, what's happening is we we have a problem with believing the inner force that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. So this is you know if if everyone who's listening takes one thing away that we are this life is miraculous. We are miraculous and living into it and believing it is just one of the most powerful things we can do to a hurting world with yes. a hurting world. So yes. on that note, I I hate to say goodbye to you. I hope we have another conversation together. Oh, of Martinez, this has been so wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. And, and um, in your work and you're you're great with you have a tremendous knowledge of biocognition. I was really impressed. <laughs> Thank, thank you. I'm a fan. And and um, I really appreciate that. And Dr. Martinez, what do you want to share with us? How we can find you? What you're excited about? Latest book? Anything? Please tell okay. us. Okay. Um, the, the best way would be biocognitive.com. That's my website. 
but I have over 350 free, of course, videos on uh, on YouTube. My book is doing really well. If, if, if the Mind Body uh, Code continues to be a bestseller after many years, you can get that at Amazon. But uh, my uh, my channel YouTube is just Dr. Martinez, Dr. Mario Martinez. But what I'm excited about is that we're developing a uh, a questionnaire based on on what I my work with centenarians. And this questionnaire will give us eight factors that I found that are important for, for centenarians. Then we're going to be working with a company that does uh, very powerful biomarkers of aging. And we're going to look at biological uh, age. We're going to look at those uh, markers, correlate them, and then teach people how to reverse their biological age. Beautiful. Beautiful. Excellent. I'm excited about that too. And the other good news is that we're finding with, with semi-super centenarians, which I work all over, not only blue songs, but all over. As you grow older, when you start getting to your 90s, you begin to develop compensatory processes to help you fight the usual inflammation. As you grow old, get older, you have you have some kind of compensatory processes similar to the young people. Wow. Wow. So Amazing. again, miraculous. Yes, yes. I so look forward to seeing how that work unfolds. And thank you so much. You're um, and for um, Equus fans, you can find us on, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find us on Equus Inspired on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Please follow us and, um, and join us also in conversation with Thunder Bear Yates when uh, we already had that conversation, but it's on YouTube. So watch it again. And um, until we see each other again, Dr. Martinez, thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Wonderful. Okay. Have a beautiful day. Thank you.